I'm Lauren Weedman, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Ann and Damien. Damien, I did it. I finished Yellow Jackets. <gasps> I just figured I would wait to tell you. I finished it yesterday. It was like my reward to myself over my lunch break. And I really have to say that I think it nailed the beginning and the end. And the, like, I think it nailed all of it. I was very impressed. I think that it all paid off and who knows what's to come. But it's one of the few shows I think that I've seen in a long time that I feel like didn't get worse as it went on, it actually, I think, got better and then went out with a bang. Yeah, it was interesting. I think I had an expectation that, that I would be dissatisfied with the finale because when I first started... Okay, so I will let you know when I'm going to do a spoiler, folks, so that you don't have to worry about... So this is all just, like, generic about the show. But when I first yeah. started the series, I assumed that they would be, like, saved by the end, that they would, like, be off the island wherever they are in Canada like I assumed that they would be rescued because it's about a plane crash as I continued to watch it I realized that that was probably unlikely and then I was like oh is it I figured it was like a one season thing and then I was like oh it's coming back for a second season okay so I think I had tempered my expectations about what questions would be answered and then going into the finale I was like well this is for sure gonna be bad it's gonna like set up a bunch of new fucking mystery but not solve any of this stuff and then honestly I came Mm -hmm. in and I felt like I felt like it resolved some like dangling things that I like honestly kind of forgot about, like the woman. Same, same. Spoiler: the woman that like was in Misty's basement and like all of those things. Like it resolved some dangling storylines and set up some new stuff, but also it had like levity and like it always did. But that again, a spoiler: that shot of the three of them then joined by a psychotic Christina Ricci as Misty to <laughs> "You gotta keep them separated" was so fucking satisfied. It. Th- thrilled me beyond belief and I was like oh like know. this show like, knows this what is it what is. TV can do <laughs> I was like it's this like a show slow-mo shot of each of their faces and I was like yeah I was like this show knows what it is doing it's like it's giving us like a lot of suspense but it's also giving us like badass women doing badass things it's giving us female friendship but it's also giving us like comedy like the show knows what world that character yes. Misty is in like I feel like it makes yes. no sense but I bought into it at this point you know yes really thought the whole show was just so glorious and I don't know if you read this I finally went back and read all the things that I had been avoiding for the last two weeks and I had forgotten that Melanie Linsky they wanted her for Shauna no question and they pursued her very hardly and she was like I will only do it if you show me what you have planned out and they're like we have five seasons planned and she was like I want to see it and so she had like a closed door meeting with the creators who told her what is going to happen to her character, like who lives and dies and what the plan is for five seasons of the show. And only then did she sign on and she's the only person that knows. That is cool. I did not see that and I'm, I'm, I have chills. Also, did you just see that thing that they did an interview and I'm, and I'm going to misremember a little bit of the logistics, but it was like the network or a producer, somebody had said like, okay, so like Melanie, what are you going to do? Like, are you going to get a trainer? Like, I'm sure the network will pay for oh, one. Yeah. And that Juliette Lewis and Tawny Cypress and Christina Ricci were all like, it said like, the article said like, especially Juliette Lewis were basically like, fuck that. And I was into them being united. I also read that Juliette Lewis like hates, the, like hates the way her character's arc was written, and like because she didn't know where it was going, and is like annoyed with like her arc thus far. Ah, uh, I won't say anything, but that is interesting based on what our friend said that they witnessed at the talkback after the series premiere in Los Angeles, and perhaps that's why she was upset. However, I will say I think she's very good in it, and I was just so pleased to be reminded of what a good actor she is and I know she's a Scientologist and it's very hard to swallow but she's so good and she is able to play not just like the tough not just like the little bit kooky crazy she really has some great dramatic scenes so can't recommend Yellow Jackets highly enough we will keep this zone spoiler free as Damien said because we really need you to go watch it it's so good and shout out to Dan, our listener, Dan, who uh, gave us that, a little bit of intel from the Vulture Fest. Oh, can I give, okay, this is, I'm going to do the Jan Hooks fast forward sound, so I'll do it again when it's done. But I do want to bring up one spoilery thing, if I may. Okay, spoiler alert. So 
I saw some rumors of like people that people were stunt casting as Lottie for the future season mm. because if we're, we're going in the same idea of like actors that have been working since they were young people. And yeah. I was like, who are they going to suggest? Like I was like, because I was like, I was trying to think of who they would cast. So I was looking online to see who people would suggest as you know Lottie in the future and I was very into seeing them suggest Danica McKellar from what the Wonder Years I was really not in that into mm, that suggestion Cooper, yeah. yeah 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 but I get the 90s she appeal. was not for me and then the other person was Shannon Sossman who I was like oh I forgot about her and I'm into that that I am into because it also scratches the 90s appeal like 90s yes, early yes. aughts but also I haven't seen her in a while and I think she's has gravitas Danica you know she's like sexy what? mathematician I'm not, I was never a Winnie Cooper person. I was a Phoebe Cates person. <laughs> I like the Shannon Sossaman idea. She, she, I remember her being really stunning and she was in that movie, The Rules, The Laws of Attraction, The Rules of Attraction. I was confused them. One is with Piercy B and one is with <laughs> James Vanderbeek James Van Der Beek. and Ian Summerholder. Also Faye Dunaway. <laughs> Whatever the one is with James Vanderbeek, it's Shannon Sossaman. And Faye Dunaway like walks into like someone having gay sex or something, right? Is that is Faye Dunaway in that? She's movie? somebody's a mom. I, I do not remember. I that. would put money on it, but I will not look it up online right now. Okay, great. I I'll put thirty cents on it not being her, but I I hope to be wrong because honestly, it would make me revisit it. I think I masturbated to that movie like <laughs> on, when I like I like, downloaded an illegal copy on Kazaa. <gasps> that is the end of the spoilers, right? Do you have anything else you wanted to say? I just wanted to give no. people an in and out. Please go watch The Yellow Jackets. We will continue to not spoil it for you because we really encourage you to watch it. It is the foundation of this show. It is all women. It is women's stories. It's what we do here at this podcast known as You Might Know Her From with Damien and Anne. Oh my gosh, welcome back. Hi, I'm Damien. Hi, I'm Anne. And this is our show where we shoot the shit with each other about what's happening in our week, what we're watching, what we're reading, what we're listening to. Not really so much what we're listening to. Usually we listen to like the same 10 things and like one of them is the soundtrack from Greece. <laughs> But we also interview an actress or non cis performer each episode, and we dive deep into their career and talk about the in and outs, the highs and lows, and try to get a little bit of dirt along the way. So welcome to the show. This week, we have a guest that we are both super excited about. And to offer a little bit of context, I say this in the uh, interview, but I had the great opportunity to meet Lauren. We'd been a couple times. I actually saw her solo show in New York with my one of my closest friends, Elisa, who brought me like through a connection to Lauren's friend, David. So shout out to Elise and David for making that kismet moment happen and I have been such a fan of hers ever since so seeing her career blow up after like being such a fan like 10 years ago has been such a great joy so getting to you know praise her congratulate her have some time with her was really just so special and I think you folks are going to like it you might know her from looking hung the daily show date night hacks arrested development Euphoria, and her many solo shows. We're so glad to be here today with actor, writer, and artist Lauren Weedman. Lauren, thank you for being on You Might Know Her From. Oh, I thought you were asking me a question. I'm like, I may, who? <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I was going through your art. You know what? I'll let you talk. How about that? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm always flattered when someone looks at our catalog of episodes, if that's what you're going to say. So I was going to say that. Oh, my God, we're already connecting. Yes. And I was looking through, I was like, my God, what did I, I knew so many people, not like friends, but knew, you know, knew who they were. And I was like, my God, is this a great setup for... Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Set up. And like, Joke. our listeners might best know you from like looking or Arrested Development or your many memorable roles on like countless hit TV shows and big blockbuster movies. But <laughs> I feel like it's important to set context because I would be remiss if I didn't start this interview with saying like, you have this very impressive body of solo work in the theater. And I had the great pleasure of seeing you do your solo show bust about your time volunteering at the Women's LA Prison back in 2009, I believe, at Ars Nova in New York. You were doing the show in New York. You weren't based here. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. Like It's one of the best theatrical experiences I've ever had in my entire life, in my top 10. One of the best things I've ever seen. So, Are you mostly like a children's theater kind of person? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I can't, I know when I say solo theater, like, I think that people don't know what to think. And it's like that you're doing something. At the I think top they, of I game. feel like, and not to be a know-it-all, but I feel like I know what they think. They think, oh God, what a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh no, thanks for the heads up. 
solo theater your thing? <laughs> That's a good thing to know. <laughs> Because I am I I understand, too. Yeah, they think of lots of wigs and, like, trying to get on SNL. That's what I think of. Yeah, when like I a think big, long your... audition, a big, long audition. It, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so you have, oh, at this point in your career, you have over 11 solo shows. Yeah. Like, the most recent, I believe, was Lauren Weeman doesn't live here anymore. Right. How has your process changed now that you have 11 shows under your belt? Like, do you, how do you approach a new solo piece that you've done so many? Well, first of all, I, it's hard for me to do them now because I have a child and that let's, and I, I care about him. I don't mean to throw him under the bus and blame him for everything, but because of, and I've heard Sandra Bernhardt talk about this. How it's like, she's like, I don't travel. My kid's here. You have to, and I get very like, I'm like, good. Okay. There's people that I like that have also had to make these sacrifices, obviously throughout time, but I'm not able to go because it takes some time and you got to to do one right you got to get into it for me because I'm very deep I better say that in case it's not apparent super deep (laughs) and I need time to like yeah be alone and and it's so self-absorbed the only problem with having done so many is that I immediately go to the end thing you know I forget process and I'm so passionate about process but I'll I'll think immediately like oh god no I should make sure that or I I remember in bust I love that stool I like a stool on wheels I need to have more stool on wheels moments like you just want to repeat <laughs> moments you know I guess with every live theater thing you just want to go back to like you know like well that went well and so your body just keeps like Pavlovian like I'm gonna go towards that thing that's always worked and so what I love about it what's hard about it is to break everything that just happened and to come up with a new way of how you want to tell the next story that's not like the other one. So it's so it's fun to do, you know, but it gets harder and harder just to sit, be on stage by yourself. I don't know. It's like it, it's lonely enough, you know, anymore. And I do have moments like my last solo show. I was like, because, you know, it's always me backstage. I'm like, have a good show, everybody. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and then if it's not a great audience, if they're not there for you, then you really are like and then all the crew is like trying to be respectful. Just like, I know you're trying to save your voice. I just always feel like walking out of the theater to like, you know, it's lonely. Like that's not a song, but if you know what I mean, like a lonely song. Anyway, I don't I don't yeah. pity myself. I just mean, I, there's just certain challenges <laughs> to it that some things have gotten easier in that way and some things. But I still love it because you don't have to deal with others. You see, the thing I hate is what I love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Sandra Bernhard. Were there other like solo artists doing things that sort of put you in a place where you said like, oh, yeah, that's something that works for me, like Lily Tomlin or somebody like a solo artist like that? Did you have people you admired? I did. I was really into um, Whoopi um, Goldberg. Goldberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I couldn't pronounce her last name because it's so, you know, (laughs) I'm not I don't know Portuguese. I can't say. Anyway, so I've I loved her. But we're talking Whoopi Goldberg in the 80s when she was on HBO. Yeah, on yeah. and I yeah. just remember that being like, yeah. wait a minute, you can do comedy that's also true, like have truth to it that's intense. I was like, I was in high school and I saw that and that was, because when I was in comedies, I was in plays and stuff and musical theater, I'd, it gave me, I always felt, I had like a mild anxiety to be in a show where there was nothing but laughter, where it felt like a Simpsons of like, ha, 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 where I'm like, I can't, I can't, what if something real comes out? Like, will they? I just always found it a little, yeah, not, not me. And then Danny Hawk, who's like a guy from Brooklyn, I think, or I know he's East Coast, but he's somebody I saw touring around and he does character stuff, kind of like Jonathan Leguizamo. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I like, I like all those people. You know, in addition to your solo work, you have these two collections of essays. So in 2007, you had A Woman Trapped in a Woman's Body, Tales from a Life of Cringe. In 2016's Misfortune, Fresh Perspectives on Having It All from Someone Who Is Not Okay. So in these books, you sort of explore a lot of, you know, deep, somewhat dark stuff like your relationship, your search for your birth mother, the birth of your child, the eventual relationship between your birth mother and your adoptive yeah. mom, your ex-husband's affair with a babysitter. Like, Dear this God, is Anne. A lot. I'm just getting it <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah, but you really like you know, did your work. I feel like I could see you in school. Like, oh, God, Anne's going to go. Go ahead, yeah. Anne. You got it covered. You're like, oh, boy, <laughs> her again. Here right, we go. Keep going. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> No, but like, how do you navigate sort of how much of your personal life is in your work and what that looks like with your real life relationships with these people who are part of your work? Well, it's, you know, you're in your different periods of your life, you have different real awareness about things like you only handle so much truth. Mm-hmm. And so for a long time, I was like, like in my 20s and 30s, I was like, I, I only do my perspective of things. So I'm not actually telling the truth about anybody. It's just my way that I saw them at the time. You know, my mother was not that way at her mother's funeral, the way I portray her. It's how my 16-year-old self saw her. 
So I was always really clear about that. And then it's when kids get involved. It's when these people that are like, it's these fucking kids, you guys. Sorry. I'm just, I really hope this is a cautionary tale. No, but like the first, I, <laughs> and my friends were in theater. I was around, you know, artsy types and a lot of probably alcoholics didn't recognize, recognize themselves. I had a couple of friends like that. Where I was like, Oh no, Shelly's going to know it's her, you know? And then she's like, I love that character you did. That dude is a freaking mess, man. And, the, and I'm like, Oh, perfect. <laughs> so people didn't notice, know I was doing them. And then, with the, the kid, the first time I wrote, in fact, he was, I was just talking to him last night. He's my stepson. He's my, are, do, once you're, if you divorce somebody and you had a stepson, there's still a stepson, right? I don't know. That's the whole so. premise of Clueless. She like fucks her old stepbrother. What? <laughs> so I don't know. No, I mean, no, I, I'm not right. implying. <laughs> no, 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 you're not. I'm like, you're, okay. I, I, mean, I think he's attractive, but I would never. <laughs> the problem is, yes, it's gotten more problematic as I get older because you really do feel like you don't want to expose I feel this responsibility about like, I invited my kid to this party, right? I invited him here. Like other people, hey, you, it's your story. I don't know who invited you. You know, like, sorry if I'm, I misbehave at this party. It's, you know, I'm not responsible for it, whatever. But I felt this like responsibility to Leo a bit where I'm like, well, he doesn't, I don't need to tell all the, you know, and, which really was a problem because I was like, what's going to happen now? You know, there's always some challenge. It's like when you're working in a, this is so corny. I sound like a teacher. I'm like, but let's say you're working in a new theater space and there's a column in the way. You have to find a way to, you have to creatively use that column and hopefully you use it and don't just ignore it and it makes something better happen. That's what I feel like with Mm -hmm. telling stories now that yes, I still tell personal stuff. I just have to find some ways or some ways into stories or ways that aren't just so like, and then I, my boob came out of my side of my shirt. Like every story is not, which is age appropriate anyway for that sort of to fade away. So, yeah, I don't know. It's always it's it's changed. And I tell people if I'm writing about them, by the way, I, I always do they get to see a copy yes, of it before yes, it goes I, to publication? Yes, and I tell people, okay. just so you know, I mentioned that you were smoking pot producer like in the office. And then they're usually like people just want to be included and not ambushed, you know, is the main mm-hmm, thing, mm-hmm, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's been a while. I can't make up stuff is a problem. It's like I'm so un- I'm, so, I'm just like a big gossip. Honestly, during the pandemic, all I lived for was gossip. Every time I saw somebody, I was like, do you have any gossip for me? Literally, I need Oh, anything. my God. I know. Just tell me. And I wanted people to tell me, really. Like, I had... I, but now I'm kind of stuck. I shouldn't say that. I'm friends with these people, in case they recognize themselves, who, like, would tell me about what go- was going on with their squirrels. They're like, oh, we've got these two fighting squirrels. And during the pandemic, I was like, what's going on with the squirrels? And now I'm like, why would you think I would care about a squirrel? Do you not think I have bigger <laughs> they, things? They definitely won't recognize themselves in this. They won't. They'll they won't never know. That's everybody these days talking about their squirrels. You have too many people with squirrels totally. in your life. Where are you from, Anne? Like, where are you from originally? I'm from Missouri originally. Oh, so. my God. Does that speak to you? What's so weird? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's from Missouri. <laughs> where in Missouri? Columbia. It's like where the university is. Oh, you had to throw in the university. Well, it's like nobody knows where it is. So it's like, okay, people, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, like, what am I going to say? Like the middle of the state? Nobody knows. No, you're just like, isn't it all the middle of the state? I'm from Indiana. I'm just trying to be. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'm with I spent time in Independence, Missouri. Oh, nice. Right outside of Kansas City. I think I was molested there, but I don't want to bum people out. (laughs) What? No. Why were you there? I had a friend in grade school who moved to Missouri. She was like a preacher's daughter. And I was friends with her mm, for go. like two months. And then, you you know, in third grade, you're like, we're best friends. And she moved. I was devastated. <laughs> and then I, my mother let me get on a plane to fly out by myself to see her in like sixth grade. And she taught me like a, I don't know, I was going to say like a Loretta Lynn country, but not Loretta Lynn, like a Bobby, who's that one country singer? Is a Bobby, Bobby Gentry. Thank you. Bobby Gentry song. It, like I landed in this Missouri, Independence, Missouri. My friend Melissa taught me how to, she's like, pull your shorts up so your butt hangs out the bottom of your shorts. And she, okay, this is always the preacher's daughter. They'll always get you with that but th- information. How can that it's be? Like the most religious are the it's craziest. True. They are the She stuck craziest. out of her window. Who does that? I was like, what is this, Footloose? We'd go out the window, and she had like a 16-year-old boyfriend, and she was going to set me up with a 19-year-old. I was like, I'm 11. She's like, he's in the, he's in the army. And I'm like, perfect. I love him. And I, remember I, was, I went to the Kansas City Royal game, and we got free halter tops. That was the giveaway. <laughs> It was halter top day and we went in the bathroom and we put that halter top on and just walked around and like would drop notes for boys. She was doing this to me. She turned me into a whore. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I had done, I had a cousin. This was my cousin. I, I identify with that very strongly. 
it's Missouri. Oh, I just want okay. to get a picture of you know where you're from. Uh, oh, <laughs> thank man. you, thank you for that portrait. Okay, so Lauren, one of your most memorable roles is as Doris on the HBO dramedy Looking, where you're like an honorary gay man in this clique with Jonathan Groff, Frankie J. Alvarez, and your bestie on the show, Murray Bartlett. Oh, Murray, <laughs> you strike us as a person that is like beloved by queer people, and that you probably have like a lot of gay and lesbian friends. So, did Looking so. feel like a natural fit and or resonate for you, like as an actor? I have started to realize casting wise that everything I get is pretty much that I'm a tough fit. And then when it fits, it fits like I'm, mm. I'm me. I get to be me. It's, it's got to be a I mean, not 100 percent, but but I'm the ones that are the most successful to or feel the most fun are the ones where I can improv and stuff. And that part not it was totally me. I mean, it was my world. Except for the fact that on the show, I have like a relationship. <laughs> That's the only difference. <laughs> I mean, I've had them. It just feels like it's been so long. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely, most of my friends are somewhere in the gay world always. Like I've, I'm deeply in that world. And I, so it felt, mm-hmm. it was so perfect. Everything about it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. And I love the fact that I was, it's actually at the time of when I got the, the job, it was the only time in my life, in my career, that I was offered a series regular part for and for another one as well like I got two offers at the same time which is that hasn't happened since but or before and one was for that one that's with Rashida Jones and it was like a it was a Steve Carell produced it Angie Tribeca is that it? yes I think that's right yeah but anyway so I was offered a part of <laughs> that and, and my, my agent was like you want to be a part of something it's probably got bigger names the TBS things it's more of a chance it's going to get picked up and it's you know going to have more money for sure and it's going to be a longer life or you want to do the HBO thing and I, you're coming in as a reoccurring. It's only if you become beloved, which I thought seemed like, that seems like what a, that's an awful direction to give somebody, right? I was like, how can mm. you become, they're like yeah. Margaret Cho. They want someone like mm. Margaret Cho, become beloved. Like, what were your tactics then? Like, because like, we were thinking like, if that, if someone told me that I would like be in a fucking mental case because I would be in my head then like, I am beloved, right? Yes. Like, how do I, like, wh- like, what tactics did you do to like secure that? Or were you just like, I have to let that go? It was only because of the environment of these boys that I didn't even think about it because I truly was just so happy. Like, I, I really was having such a good time. In any other environment, when you're acting and you're just in your head the whole time going like, I, God, I, they, they're buying a second house? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> like, I just sit there constantly <laughs> reacting all the time. And I don't have a lot to do so much when I'm working in TV. It seems like, you know, I'll be, I'm smaller parts. And so I'll sit there and I just have time for my head just to be running wild. And in looking, I always had something to do. And, I, and, and so I was, you know, I'm like a border collie. I had sheep. And I could do stuff and I, I, I was in the story and I knew it was, and even if I wasn't, I knew that my job was just to enjoy myself and they would not, they were so supportive about like, like they never made me feel like, Lauren, you've got to stop jabbering mm. away. Like you cannot keep talking and say, once in a while they would go, okay, let's do another take. And Lauren, this time, maybe just for fun so we have it, just maybe just the script one time, just so we have it. <laughs> so I have an option. And I realized I'd gotten so cocky about that I could because I didn't feel like the, the, the pressure was on me. I really felt like it was all on them anyway. So I could just be like in the background, truly having a good time. Because there's no, if you take out the sexual stuff, the if you take out straight men and actresses, straight actresses, oh, I'm going to get, okay. I, I, didn't, no, go. I didn't think no, about this. Us. Is this offensive? You're taking, if you take out this element of, of sexuality being a really strong tool of how people are operating in the world, if you take out the straight people... <laughs> I'm straight. I still yes, feel straight. We're, we're listening. You we're take listening. it away. No, if you take yeah. it away, you can get more done. Like, it's just not so much like, like, it wasn't so much about people hoping that somebody else was hoping they were going to, I don't know. Can I curse? Mm, I don't know. Are yeah, you, on- you of course can, but the gay men weren't preening. Like, I feel like the gay men can preen. Like, it can be all about sex with gay men. They but- can, but this was a very unique little group. That's great. These are some sweet boys. Jonathan Groff kind of leads that. He's very kind of real and grout. I mean, he's totally fun and flirty, but not in a weird manipulative kind of Mm. head. I'm just so sensitive to that kind of thing. If I think that people are being secretive or being weird or being sort of like, you know, like so-and-so just got married. I'm like, why is she being finger blasted in the corner? Like, well, and, I, I, and also I think that it's probably also speaks to like straight people have been able to use sexuality, both genders, in order to advance their career in Hollywood or in the industry where I think queer people often have to shrink that part of them historically mm-hmm. because they weren't allowed to be sexual yeah. beings because they had to be like, I have to be straight acting or whatever, you know? Right. 
Well, because it's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. It's a sin. Um, it's yeah, a sin. no, yeah. You know what? That's a good point. And I think a lot of this too, of course, is always it's about me. It's more that <laughs> I get insecure when I'm around these actresses that or I have in the past, just watching them eat or watching mm-hmm. them do I just get really I'm very high school like that, where I'm like, I is that all your ha- like, you know, you're just gonna have those strips of cucumber, Deborah missing? Mm. That's all? You're gonna have that? That's all? Okay. <laughs> well, I don't you wonder if that's do you think that's why you got that dizzy spell earlier? Okay. <laughs> Like, just this world where you're supposed to act like you don't see what's going on, or no, that's fine, or oh, she didn't do that, or oh, I heard her yelling at her assistant. No, it's okay, it's her cousin. Like, these uh, bad behavior or these just this mental illness of things with eating, and even I'm so judgmental, I guess. Or if I even think that people are being flirtatious who are married, who aren't in some kind of open relationship, I just get really like, why are they doing that? That doesn't seem right. Does her husband? That's gonna be so- what about their kids? Like, I just, blah, blah, blah. and so in this environment, there just happened to be some sweet people who were, and it wasn't a huge, nobody was there to pay their mortgage. I mean, Scott Bakula maybe, but he was also fantastic. He was very sweet. He's yeah. from Ohio. And I he was, love him. He was I love great. Him. I love him. Yeah, he's really lovable. He's like, and he's an actor. He is like pro. I mean, the show ran for two seasons, but then you also got this movie to sort of tie up the loose ends. So spoiler alert for those who haven't finished the film, you and your partner Malik end the series sort of talking about having a baby. And that is like Doris's big moment. Were you satisfied with that ending and like how they wrapped her up? No, I mean, the movie itself, at one point I was like, don't you just feel like that we buried grandma and it's kind of weird to go like, let's dig her up. Let's put her at the table for birthdays. Like it felt like, mm, I feel like I knew it was over. And so it felt weird to like, mm. I was glad to do it. And then once mm. I saw it, well, and while we were shooting the film, I felt like I was a bit in shock, like in mourning about, and I, and as an actor and as mm. anybody, I guess when you have something that's been really, it was a real high for me because I was making more money than I ever had. I was around, these people that I love so much, I was doing work. I never was allowed to do real, to get into real acting on camera. Nobody ever gave me that. No one ever gave me a shot. Like I sound so, but you know, but it was a big deal. And yeah. I just had gone through this divorce and it was a lot of stuff was going on that I was sort of, I, I remember thinking during the film, like the movie, I was like, I don't know if it's, I, I just felt emotional, I think. And, and then the final shot in the movie is they're eating at, I think it's called Annie's. It's like a, it's a restaurant in the, the Castro, mm-hmm. right? The Castro. And they wanted to shoot the last scene so that the sun would be coming up as we were eating breakfast. And everybody's super giddy because we had to stay up all night. So you're like slap happy, you know, and everybody's just very like. And then when Andrew uh, Haig, I can never say his name right. I'm like, hey, hey. The director, Andrew, came in and he was like, that's a wrap. Looking is done. And he didn't do the thing where he goes, well, you guys, you don't know. Could have a Christmas special or may come back or they love you. No bullshit. He was just like, it's done. He goes, "Uh, that's it. Looking's over. And then we got up, went outside and I've never seen the Castro with nobody in it. And there's nobody in it. And there was, I had this super, oh God, dramatic flash in my head of all the people that came to San Francisco to be saved. And I was like, and I, cause you, for the first to not have anybody out there, I was like, I hear the ghosts of all the, a-. like it was, I know I'm being, <laughs> it makes me cry. It was such a like, it was so, and I was a part of it. I'm like, I'm a part of a tiny bit of history of something I care about so much of these boys surviving or some, finding a place to, you know, like I just, yeah. yeah. I only think of the gay boys. I never think of lesbians coming to San Francisco. Sorry. That's okay. They did. They did. Did they? I don't, I never saw their houses, so I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but that thing of like seeing, being a part of it and being this historic, blah, 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 that kind of thing is so wonderful. And I, I just, I also hope that there's, it's hard to be a part of this kind of shows, I think, that really matter. And even if people don't like looking, I'm always so okay with their critique and everything about it. I'm like, right, right on, man. It still mattered to some people. So it's all yeah. good. It made, yeah. it had its point. It, it served a purpose. So. And it's nice that there was, you were able to have closure with it. That sounds beautiful. It was, it was, was, then it was hard to kind of get over like, you know, or that you walk around going like, well, I guess I'll be on another show soon. (laughs) I mean, everybody says I'm amazing. (laughs) Like, I guess I'll be winning Emmy. Like you get so like, it's such a weird, anyway, it was great. Okay. So backtracking a little bit in your career, you were a correspondent on Comedy Central's The Daily Show with Jon Stewart for one season in 2001. And You've already spoken about this very candidly about how the show really wasn't the right fit for you and your talents at the time. But what we were thinking about when we were doing our research was like, 
you know, did you have a buddy when you were in those days? Or did, were you feeling like you were really, like, left to your own devices? The gay boy. <laughs> the, the, one, the gay person on set? <laughs> there were, like, two in the building. And I did find, like, and in fact, at the time, the person I'm uh, thinking, yeah, I became friends with the producer. And I would, the same way I would, when I got to, when I would go to high school, we would all run to the theater room, mm-hmm. like to get there before, just like safety, safety, like running through the hallways to try to then, oh, God, like, thank God I made it here. That's how I was about getting to this guy's, it was Dan Taberski. And I would get to Dan's office. He's a podcaster. He's awesome. And I w- would run there just because I, I didn't even know that he was what his sexual orientation was. I just found out later because we're, we're good friends now. But um, yeah, he got me through it because he would, everybody else was, if they sense that someone's having a hard time, you just don't want to be friends with that person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're just like, scoot, scoot, chair back, scoot, chair back. Because I was constantly like, you guys, am I doing this? For-? I was always talking too damn much. I was really like, what's going on? Am I not doing this right? Or am I supposed to do it just like Steve? Steve Carell or Colbert, aren't I supposed to? And people are like, shh, don't talk anymore. Just when John comes in, shut up. Like, Mm. wait for it. Leave the building even. If if you feel like you can't shut up, leave the building. We'll call you. We'll page you out of pager. If you're suddenly, if they call for you over the intercom, because they'd be like, please come to the set or, or to a meeting, we will page you, jump in a cab, we'll cover for you. Just get out of the building and stop talking about how you don't understand what's going on. So, yes, I was saved by having... That's a good question, because, of course, it always is one person, right, that, like... Well, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he was one, too, who was just like, oh, you're fired. Like, he was also, <laughs> like, very real talk about it, where he was like, no, you're not bad, Lauren. Like, he kept my sanity. Yeah. Where he was like, you're not... This doesn't mean that you're an awful actor. It means that they don't know what to do with you, and John is a little bit annoyed by you making jokes all the time. <laughs> It seems like it would be like my guess is it would be like very broy comedy energy behind the scenes, but also like very cutthroat because it's also it was like political. So there's also that thread where people are trying to be very smart and very funny. But like in your book, you talked about how people were like, stop making jokes, like stop trying to be funny because nobody likes that. Yeah, they're basically that was me, though. Like I was like, they don't realize they're like, you don't have to be on. And I'm like, I wish you would have told me that in third grade because I because <laughs> I've been on for. Damien, right? You're like, I've been on for so that I don't even notice that that's that's how I operate. And then I, I guess I turn off when I'm sleeping or something. Yeah. So, and I can't help. I mean, I and and then I was so aware of like I must be really annoying. So I got very insecure. Mm. It was it was so me though. Like I couldn't, I didn't even recognize that things were hard for me, like the meetings and the broiness and the fact the female thing of just never. But I always just thought it was me. Like I was always like, oh God, I'm really sucking. And they'd say to me like, no, Lauren, they don't use a lot of women. They don't prefer it. I was also told that they use another woman more who was a freelancer because she was cuter than I was. Mm. Oh, my God. And, yeah. Like, and I remember being like, this is it was my first TV job. So I'm like, wow, this is what they told you in theater school is that they're like, hey, if you're going to be heavy, you're going to be like, they would be really harsh to you. Like, that's what it's like out there. And I was like, oh, shit. Mm. My movement teacher from theater school is right. <laughs> People That's are going to straight up be like, you know, you seem like a sexless lesbian, oh you know, God. where I'm like, oh, OK. Right. But does that mean I'm smart? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so were, I don't know. You, it was hard. It was definitely hard for me. It sounds awful. Were you there for 9-11 mm-hmm. based on the timeline? Like, how weird was that? Was that horrifying? What was that like? Well, it was cool to be a part of some of a thing that mattered again. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I felt like and also, by the way, I when I was on the show you know, for the year I was, I loved the show. Like, and I, even with John, where I was like, God, he's so hard. I love him. Like, I was like, God, he's such a, what an ego. He thinks it's all, he acts like he's all humble. He's not humble at all. Like, what if, what a bunch of bullshit. And then I'd still be like, but damn, is he wonderful? Is he so good at this? And he's so smart. I just always feel like, ah, who's Kofi Annan? I'm dumb. Um, <laughs> but no, the, the 9-11 thing was, was amazing to be a part of, you know, it's for theater and especially when solo theater, I don't have a ton of community. Like I have it in the, the cities that I've lived in where I've done theater. I've, I've made, you know, I've got house managers I'm still friends with, but it's like you don't have a lot. of. So to be a part of a job, like an office place is so it's kind of like looking just to be a part of something is so nice for a while. So I was definitely glad to be to be there for all the, just weird to be in New York. Were you guys there for 9-11? You guys were. Was I was a year born. before I moved to New York. Same. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. You moved right afterwards. You're like, that sounds okay. I I love to. Yeah. That's over. (laughs) Now we can go. (laughs) Okay. So 
one of the shows where you got a lot to sort of dive into was on the HBO series Hung, which follows like the travails of a gigolo in suburban Detroit. You played Horny Patty, the proofreader, who masturbated at the office while her co-workers were in the room. Like, what was the audition process like for that particular character? <laughs> Horny Patty, I just had to read a monologue, which I loved because it was about, it was acting. I got to really, it was talking about how I love to go to SeaWorld. It was just a little monologue mm-hmm. where I'm just like, I, I, and you're going to pretend that you like me, right? I was just talking to him and it was just like a, a, a troubled, weird head case chick, right? Who was like, and I didn't, you know, she got broader as the season or as the shows went on, but uh, it was that. It was like a vulnerable, yeah, lonely lady. And I really, I'm like, wheelhouse. And so- Though people still, they not anymore actually. For a while though, I'd be like with my my bait, my kid was little, like horny Patty. I'm like, that's me. <laughs> you had this great scene where you had to really rough up Jane Adams yeah. in a bathroom after her character starts like spreading the room, like this, the, not the rumor, but starts to talk about you and t- Thomas Jane fucking. Yeah. How method did you get when you really faced off with Jane? She's so great. She's like she is. Uh, like my one of my favorite people I've gotten to work with too, like especially female actress wise. She's just such a, she's so into like go ahead, just do, no, just do it, just do it. I don't care. Like and now that people are so much more well, all sorts of reasons more careful. But you've always got somebody there like yeah, I heard you're going to be standing on a chair. I'm here for safety, and you're like I think I could stand on a chair, and they're like well you say that, and you're like okay, show me how, and then go ahead and spot me. <laughs> but this was long ago enough that that she was just like throw it no no really throw me Lauren like really throw me up against there and she's so Juilliard trained that she's like I'll do everything mm. she's like you don't don't you worry I'm gonna make it look like you just do it hard I'll protect myself like she was so oh that would have made me paranoid in a different way then then I would have been like <laughs> I don't know I was I didn't want I don't want to let her down you know so it's like whatever you need yeah you were great whatever you need <laughs> yeah that was really super also just being a weird. Yeah, but the sex scenes were great. I had, I had a lot of t- fun doing those. So you've had a lot of memorable roles in like big comedies like the Tina Fey, Steve Carell film, Date Night, the Jason Segel, Emily Blunt rom-com, The Five-Year Engagement, Eddie Murphy's family film, oh Imagine God, That, the Jason so Bateman vehicle, ago. The X. So long ago. Okay, but <laughs> but you're also in like comedy classics like Arrested Development, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Reno 911. What is it like when you sort of get the call and you're tasked with doing a scene or just a few lines and you have to show up and sort of like get on set and start opposite these huge stars and like maybe you get one take maybe you get two takes and you just have to nail it are you stressed like do you go in and say they're going to get what they're going to get do you like have your thing prepared ahead of time do you improvise like what is your process when you know you've got like a few shots well i'm better now at being a guest star on these these things where you're having like a quick or it's one day of work and yeah. at one point, a makeup lady, I didn't know that, the, that I was a form of a day player. Like at one point she was like, who's it? Somebody want to do the day player? And I was like, oh, are they bringing the day players in here? And I was like, oh, no. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Tis me. I am the day player. And I don't have a name. I'm just a day player. You know, like I thought every time you get a job, it's always so fun, you know, just to right. be there. And I didn't realize that I was like, and then after looking, my ego was out of whack. So I would go do things and I really had fun doing Arrested Development, loved it. I didn't have a lot, a lot of lines, but I got to watch. All, it was like, I just felt like I was in a documentary about yeah. celebrity. Like just what happens to people after that? I mean, this was an amazing cast, all at yeah. very interesting places in their lives. So I just sat there mm. taking it all in and very entertained. Like I learned by then to enjoy it. But I went through some times, I was very bitter when I was doing Curb Your Enth- Enthusiasm it's like if they don't know you and you're not brought in because they know you, people can treat you not so great, you know, mm. and sort of and and there's there's a thing with like with acting where they don't if they don't know who I am, the, the not that they know like know who I am. But it's I get very defensive about. Oh, I know what it is, is that I'm probably insecure because I walk in not knowing any, you know, being the outsider and feeling like, wow, man, like, am I ever going to ch- get a chance to like throw me the ball? Like, will I get to play in a big way or am I always just going to be like the doctor will see you like and I've, I've done more than that but like even on Curb Enthusiasm I've, I've had several jobs where I don't have to audition and it feels amazing where you're like oh I'm just getting that I would you know love that now but anyway so I but then you go in not knowing what's going to happen and then sometimes it's like oh I'm just in doing like for Curb I was a nurse and I had one line and I was in the van driving over to the set and I was with all these other comedy actors I knew from UCB and everybody was like excited that they got to, you know, we're doing our curb. And 
I, I was, uh, I cried after that. I was like in the car afterwards, just like I had one line and Larry David is a little shocker. He's Larry David. Turns out he's yeah. an asshole, right? That's his whole thing. I was like, wow, he's kind of rude. I'm like, oh, have I not seen the show? <laughs> like he's oh, yeah. kind of rude, right? Like that's his deal. Anyway, I'm making this so depressing. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like I passed by, um, what's her name from Megan Mullally, one time I was doing just the show Children's Hospital, this comedy, mm -hmm. and I passed her in the hallway and I love her. And uh, she's like, how are you? And I go, uh, I kind of have a love hate relationship with guest stars. And she goes, yeah, God, I have a hate hate relationship with them. And I was like, that's so perfect, because honestly, it's hard to come in as the outsider. It's hard. to. So I just come in if I like the part. Great. If the people are laughing at something, I, if I have a laugh line, it's all great. It's always nerve wracking. I don't know how I, I don't have a process. I didn't then. Now I do. And now I'm older and now I don't give a shit. Now I'm really happy to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, that was a really long answer. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It gives me it, like, you know, we love your work and I know so much of your work. And then it's like, think about going in. It stresses me out on behalf of other people because I know how in my own head I would be if I had like one shot to get like the laugh line opposite. I don't know. Yeah. And they don't give a legend. shit about you, by the way. I don't mean they're mean to right. you. But you are you're a part of the story. And I think that I yeah. and actors, at least, you know, me and a lot of actors I know, they've got really messed up egos where you really are like, I'm a big deal. Right. That's why I got into this. I'm special. You love me. And so you're coming in and you're just like one part of the story. And then you go home and you just feel kind of like, well, this is certainly not what I was. But now I get the business of it. Now I'm like happy about a guest star. I'm happy to have mm -hmm. a I'm happy to have time and if they don't use me. Let's say they don't use me till the very end of the day or they have to. I'm always like, oh, my God, I could read a book. This is going to be great. Right. And now I'm old enough that people are usually when I'm a guest star, they know who I am a little bit. Or there's at least one, you know, gay boy that comes up and it's like, ah, oh, I'm props. I'm just going to make sure those glasses are yours. OK, that's all because glasses are actually props. And I just also want to say I couldn't believe it when I saw you on the call sheet. My husband and I love you. <laughs> and all you need is that. like just like you're talking about the daily show Damien. it's like all you need is one person who's yeah. like i love you and it's usually the gay boy like <laughs> who's like yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's never the straight boy it's kind of a problem that's not true it probably is probably well is. let's dive into that because i feel like you've worked opposite a lot of like male comedians or comedy men which, as we like to call them like eddie murphy larry david eddie griffin nick kroll nick offerman will arnett etc mm. seeing some of these comedies i think like how is that set for a woman who of these guys or perhaps someone we didn't name was like your cup of tea and who left a little something to be desired well nick offerman and i were we're kind of co-stars on set. And when I worked with him, he's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. He's just like, I, I challenge anybody, dog, plant, whatever, not to work with him and be like, I love him. <laughs> I mean, that's also good. leading men. And he's not necessarily leading men, per, leading man per se, but he's just such an interesting human, which is yeah. always cool to run into, right? Where you're like, oh, you have a hobbies and stuff. Also like a theater person too, got his start like in the theater. Yes. And he's not, and also anybody who's, I don't know. I just am really put off by the the emptiness of this business with it's like, you know, oh, I bought this and I'm going to eat this. I bought this. I'm going to eat this. I bought this. I'm going to eat this. And I'm like, and I can get into it, by the way. I want to buy things and eat things. So I'm not like so above it. I'm not like some Buddhist freak. But I just get, it just always feels so classist. And immediately you're like, oh, I can't buy that or eat that. Or mm. like, or I'm so fat. Or, I can't do this. Or I look like this. And you look like that. Like I get very... It feels like high school sometimes, some of, these, yeah. some of these environments. But Nick Offerman, not like that at all. Like, really interesting to talk to. And, you know, Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy was really mean to everybody but me. So I like him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What a weird dynamic. Oh, I love yeah. that. He was in a bad mood. I don't think he liked the movie. And then he was, he was crabby. You know, he was, in that, he was in that stage where he was doing a ton of movies. Yeah. And I think he was just, like, super not into it. And everybody was like, oh, he likes you. He thinks that you remind him of... Also, because I leave him alone. I'm, I'm a big one on like, I, I probably don't want to get to know you. Like, I'm not really, like, I learned my lesson with Jon Stewart. Leave the king alone. They're mm -hmm. busy. Mm -hmm. And they would, said he re would, you reminded him of who? He said I reminded him of Ruth Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's a compliment. I thought so too, but I was really hoping that maybe it'd be somebody <laughs> that he thought was pretty or something too. Like, I thought maybe I'd get a little, I told you, shallow, the thing that I hate, I love. Right, where I'm like, hoping you say something. But and at first, the person who relayed the message said Ruth Buzzy. And I was like, <laughs> what? And he was like, you know, that, that girl, the woman from the, the movie. With the, then I realized he was talking about the, I go, no, that's no, not Ruth Buzzy. Not. Love her on Twitter, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not 
But but thanks. <laughs> this is so fun to be able to do. It. This is I could do like a Kathy Griffin. I could make this a whole show. The other J- Jason. Um, the guy I was in five year engagement with. Siegel. 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 He's awesome. He seems like a good egg. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is that I'm always like, so often with like Stephen and, and Nick and Stephen Carell when a date night and stuff, I always have a moment where I'm like, oh my God, we're getting along so well. Like, he just really, like, I think he's in love with me. <laughs> and I've, I get this crush on the, I almost all, I'm like, they're so funny. Like, they, they shone their light upon me. And they compliment. And then I realize, oh, wait a minute. That's why they're leading men. You fall in love with them. That's their superpower. Mm, yeah. And yeah. It, I, I fall for it every time where I was like, oh, my God, Stephen's married. <laughs> he can't love me like that. And everybody, I tell that story to like, they're like, like a costume girl's like, oh, I know. Me too. I Me too. Like, I have that too. Like, they always are like that. It's like charming. Except for Eddie was, didn't give but, a shit. But he liked you, which is like, that's like my kind of guy. Like the one who does not nice yeah. to anybody, but like likes me. Then I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a good person. <laughs> Yeah, to, that's right. That's right. I was like, "You guys lay off." So what? He yelled at everybody, and he's completely disrespectful and walks really slow to get to his mark just to fuck with everybody. So what? <sighs> but he also, you know, the reason I think too he liked me is I truly was not. I mean, I like him and all, but I wasn't a huge. I wasn't like I can't. Wait. I was nervous when I saw him, so I would shut down. So I was like, mm. I don't want to deal with whatever weirdness. I don't. I just had come from the John Stewart thing. I'm like, I don't want to get involved. I don't want any trouble. And so I would just sit. Really quick. And then he would come over to me and start talking. I made one joke that he thought was funny. And I would make jokes in front of him and nobody else would joke with him. So it worked with him. And mm. then he would just come over to me and talk and talk and talk and tell me stories about like Yul Brenner and hot tubs. And like, and like he met Michael Jackson and like, and just one thing after the, and I loved it. And, I, and I'm not lying when I say, I was really like, yeah. this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to yeah, know that Yul Brenner were. hot tub story. <laughs> There was something coming at some kind of swinger thing. It was that Yul Brenner and his wife were swingers and that they oh, or they propositioned it. Eddie when he was younger. <gasps> oh, when he okay. was on mm. SNL. I know. I know. So it's good. Hot. I was like, yeah, yeah that, is hot. that is hot. He was hot. Mm-hmm. OK, Lauren Weedman. What? We have entered the part of our show called Rapid Fire. This is just so we can get everything else that we didn't get in in the main section out now. Go with us. If you want to be rapid, great. But it's really rapid for Ann and I just because we're going to be like this. Okay, you often get cast as lusty women. Like, in The X, you're rubbing balm on your nipple while staring down Amanda Peet. In The Little Hours, you play the lady of the castle who's fucking one of the servants played by Dave Franco. In Joshi, you're a sex worker who tells Nick Kroll and the men who hired her, the more the merrier. Of course, you're a horny patty on Hung. And on True Blood, you're a werepanther who fucks Jason Stackhouse to try and procreate more werepanthers. What is that about? Do you identify as a lusty woman? I guess so. I think it's that I'm going to go with what somebody said to me. I think it was a must have been one of my millions of boyfriends and lovers. No, it's good. But I, somebody I dated was like, it's that like, that I'm not scared of sexuality. But yeah, I think that's I think it's, I'm willing to do anything. I was I, that, that that came out wrong too. That's not true. What I meant is I, I'll go there kind of thing. I'm not scared to go yeah, there yeah, and yeah. like mess with it. In date night. You're in the book club reading a book about a young woman on her period. You're in a scene with Tina Fey, Kristen Wiig, and Steve Carell. Did you improvise your lines about literally crying or was it in the script? I think that Steven did something that I then responded to. No, he said literally afterwards. That was it, right? Literally, he's like, you know, he's like, there was improv in the audition. And then I brought it into the, the shooting of it, I believe. Yeah, there was some. That was a fun shoot. Those are fun people. I'd wanted Kristen Wiig's part. That was the one I auditioned for. But whatever, she can have it. Okay, in the HBO series Euphoria, you play Jules' therapist and get to do a series of dramatic scenes with her. This felt like a departure in so many great ways, and we got to see you do like a bunch of heavy work. Do you have to fight to get seen for dramatic roles, or does it feel like there's a sort of turning point in your career where now these are the things coming your way? I don't know, Anne. <laughs> It was so cool. I was like, wait, this is a really dramatic series of scenes. Yeah, no, I really like that. And it, it was, it was, I said to, when I left the, after shooting that, I was telling people like, you know, I've not been a part of something that mattered to me this much since looking. I said it like that too. Yeah. So I was, it's so um, <laughs> fakey sounding. So nobody liked it. No, but I was like, I love this show and I love how they put it together. And I love Hunter Schaefer. And I was like, this is a cool thing and this is a special person hunter schaefer's a special being and i i loved that part because all i had to do was listen and as i was Mm -hmm. doing it i was like i want to support that i want to be in a show like this i would sit and listen and i would have a i would be completely satisfied with my career if i could help these stories be told but then that was it that's how it is 
right? And they talk about, oh, maybe the therapist will come back, but that's the Hollywood goodbye. I always say mm. that. That's what people say goodbye to you is they go like, we're definitely going to find a way to have that stage manager written in again. And I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Just like a polite thing to say. So yeah, I wish I could, I don't know. I, I've got a new agent and I've talked about that where I'm like, I would like to do, they're like, you're like Francis McDormand. You're going to be like Francis. And I'm like, that's great. But those parts, how to get those parts are really hard. Like now mm-hmm. you've got to have been, I'm not quite famous enough to be considered for bigger parts like that. So I'd love to, we'll see. I, I, I'm with you though. I, I wish I could do that. And I'm not, I never know what it means to fight for something. Yeah, bother yeah. people I wish I had more of that <laughs> why don't you send me out for that I don't know yeah, yeah. you're very good and you looked good thank you apparently I did I got it some I had a few ladies who were like come on Lauren come on you're not straight you silly yeah goose. you looked very good it was it was a very like it was a queer friendly vibe I liked it yeah apparently it was I was hearing yeah I had a couple people who were like you led me on Lauren and I was like well I didn't know that this was happening I thought we were friends <laughs> You play a woman pregnant with quadruplets on an episode of the Showtime period series, Masters of Sex. Oh. Was the pregnant belly awful because it looked very realistic or was it kind of nice because you got to be in bed for most of your scenes? What I liked about that was I got to meet the people who were into doing prosthetics and stuff and special effects because they are, mm. it's like meeting yes. comic book people. Like they're just their own special land of like, I met this girl, just got out of college in Florida. Everybody knew, and, and she had a crew of people who were all there to specialize in this and, the, and and then to go into Burbank to some warehouse where they, you walk in and there's just like people working on like, this is gonna be a dead body for CSI. Like that's the werewolf that was used in the movie. Like, it's so that's fun. So cool. And so that part was all the, all the special effects stuff. It's always fun. I love those people. I'm always trying to, I'm always like, is anybody single? So yes, I am a lusty lady and you're right. Okay. We're going to find you somebody that's like very into latex, like prosthetics, and that's going to be your person. I may need to stop you there because I'm not sure about that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm telling you, it might come in handy. Okay. It's true, actually. I could use, uh, never mind. That's fine. I love latex. Okay. (laughs) Lauren Weedman, last question. You play the mayor of Las Vegas in the HBO series Hacks. And when we first meet your character, you're making small talk with Gene Smart at a party and you're both laughing. I was obsessed with you. You're in two episodes. So good. Did you plan what you were going to say to Gene Smart in that moment right before? Or were you just like peas and carrots, peas and carrots in her face? I don't remember exactly, but I do know that I felt really comfortable on that set. And it may be an age thing. It was the first time where I came in and Gene and myself and then the actor. Um, I, I know. He, I was telling Damien, I was like, he, you know him. He's a, you might know him from. He's, he's he was in like, Greece too. Um, yeah. Oh God, I feel, I, he'll Maxwell, never. Maxwell Damien, Caulfield, no, Adrian Zemed. No. <laughs> no, could you imagine it was Adrian Zemed? I've got, so I could go on and on about Adrian Zemed. Um, We're, this is him. the show for Us it. Too. <laughs> this is the show. Right. Too. Oh. Um, I can't remember his name. Oh, He's Christopher, so oh, Chris, oh Christopher get... McDonald from Happy Gilmore. Yeah. Oh, dear God, you are good. So he was there. And so the three of us were sort of talking like people over 50. You know, it's like its own thing. And everyone else was so much younger. And so it already felt kind of, com- I felt comfortable there. And I liked my part, felt like a good fit. They already thought I was funny in the green, like on the, in the waiting area, in the holding room. And I, it's because, and I was like, oh, this is going to go well. Like they want to laugh. They're good. So I, I don't remember what we said, but I know that I was making them laugh and they were all being really like you're really there there's a lot of compliments they're being really nice to me <laughs> i hope that you come back i really do. Was I, am into, also, back. I was into your wardrobe and your hair the whole thing i loved your whole boozy look i did too but i don't know I, they don't pay for me to do my hair that way because they were like what's your hair look like now for second season and i was like oh i'm not bleaching it and i'm like but if you want me to and they're like no that's no, okay just show us what it looks like and i'm like damn it when is it going to matter? <laughs> don't you want her hair? Are you coming back? Yeah, I think it's, I, don't, I, I guess it's okay to say that. Yeah, I am. I'm so, I'm so glad you're so good. The show was great. Lauren Weedman, thank you so much for joining us on the show. This has been like just a total delight from beginning to end. Well, what a great show. Who wouldn't? What actor? This is like an actor's dream. If like, because you feel like, oh, it sounds like I've worked. I'm some, <laughs> I'm You somebody. have, you really have. No, thanks you guys. It's, <laughs> thank you. It's very fun. When I tell you that I have not stopped thinking about Eddie Murphy, Ewell Brenner, and his wife in a hot tub, 
I just kept thinking, ooh, the possibilities are endless. And then I Googled Yule Brenner wife and he had like four. And I was like, let me just guess that it's going to be this hot one that was like, I think his third wife, not the fourth. Really, what a delight. I mean, I feel like what you said to Lauren, it was like, oh yeah, we both would have been like hot for Eddie Murphy being really cruel to everyone else and being (laughs) like, we like you. You look like this old character actress from the 1950s. (laughs) Uh, I found uh, and maybe it's part of why I respond so much to Lauren's work is that I like identify with so many like parts of her like you know and she even like I think there was a part where she was talking about like being on and she was like I wish that someone had told me that in third grade and she was and I think I must have like indicated in in the in the zoom and she was like you understand Damien and I was like I do (laughs) and like I also understand like having a crush like you would have I would have a crush on Eddie Murphy if he was mean to everyone but nice to me I'd be like he's hot for me and we're gonna fuck like I related to so many of her anecdotes and I was just so charmed by like her self-awareness of like the vapidness and emptiness and like the disordered eating of all of Hollywood but then also like the want to be a part of it because you're an artist and you also feel like what you bring to the medium is special I just love her so much I felt like I we just laughed the whole time and that like but I also felt like we talked about real things so it felt like a real coup Completely. She's hilarious. And also one of our guests who asked questions, which doesn't always happen as longtime listeners know, sometimes it's really more of a straightforward interview. And sometimes it's more Mm. of a conversation depending on, you know, our vibe in the room in the zoom room with the person. But Lauren was inquisitive. And luckily, I got to learn that she lived in Missouri at some point and maybe it was great and maybe it was terrible she was on a visit she was on a visit with her friend from like third grade (laughs) right (laughs) that's right that's right also loved her talking about like the respect for like the queer folks that were gone in San Francisco and like that moment she got to have like clarity when she was when they were like wrapping the you know wrapping it looking the film just so many like really sweet special moments like that but a moment that lingers with me that I wish that one of us had asked her about and I wonder if you heard it back in the in the edit Hmm. When she was said something about Deborah Messing eating cucumbers. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then she proceeded to tell a story about, like, that was not exactly connected to Deborah, but we're inferring that it was because she was like, Are you sure it wasn't the celery sticks that made you have that dizzy spell 20 <laughs> minutes ago? Because they were they were very close in succession, but, you know, she didn't name Deborah in that moment because there was only a beat in between them. I just assumed that we were talking about Miss Messing. I think that in the moment I actually thought, I want to ask if this is about Deborah Messing, but I think I'd rather editorialize it that it is and not have to put her in a situation to say it is or isn't. Right. Well, because it's distressing in like such a case of Hollywood, but also I think that's why so many actors are so mean because they're starving the entire time. (laughs) Uh, I I really, uh, I just, I really loved Lauren. What a treat. So um, I hope, I hope that y'all loved it too. And if you did, that you will share this episode with your friends. You'll post it on social media and that you will make sure you're subscribed and listening to You Might Know Her From. And while you're there, make sure that you leave us a written review. It is is a big deal for us if you leave us a review. We want to thank all of the listeners who've left reviews recently. They are the thing that keeps us going. They're the heartbeat that keeps us like closer to maybe getting a buck. Folks, if you like what we're laying down here, I suggest you go listen to Mixed Reviews Podcast, which is a podcast we love. We actually just got to guest on it, and we got to break down the career of one Miss Olivia Newton-John with Gavin and Louie, who run the show over there. It's a great show where they break down an entire actor's body of work. Sometimes it's a director. They usually do women, but Damien, as like when they do a man, who do they do? Like they do Ang Lee or Pedro right. Almodovar. <laughs> So you're going right. to be and into like, it. Oh, great. Yeah, it's a great podcast. And we had a lot of fun with them talking about Olivia Newton-John. And we're hoping that we can parlay that into landing Olivia Newton-John for our show. Who would like, of course, she's not a you might know her from. But of course, we make an exception for Miss Newton-John. Yes, please go check out our episode of Mixed Reviews. I think you're going to love it. They were total gentlemen. And it was a total pleasure. But now it's the part of the show where we give a little bit of a hint about who we will be interviewing next week. So if you're a person who likes blind items, this is the moment for you. And can you connect Lauren Weedman to next week's guest using only women and non-cis performers, please? Why, yes, I can. Lauren Weedman, who we love and treasure, was, of course, in Hacks with Gene Smart, the tremendous Gene Smart, who was in Watchmen with Regina King, someone we adore, who was in Poetic Justice with the excellent Janet Jackson, who was in the Fame TV show 
with Debbie Allen, <laughs> who was, of course, on Grey's Anatomy with Sara Ramirez, who is obviously in, in Just Like That with Nicole Ari Parker, who's, of course, in The Incredibly True Adventures of Two Girls in Love with former guest of this show, Laurel Holloman, who is in The L Word with next week's guest. Wow, that's a good one. And... I love that you incorporated, and just like that, you also had to, incorporated. Had to. We hadn't talked about it this episode. It felt like it was time. You also incorporated the incredibly true adventures of two girls in love, which we Dale Dickey last week's guest was also in. We didn't even get to scratch the surface with her on it, so I'm so glad you mentioned it and brought it up. It's a classic. It's at the Sundance Film Festival, and I believe it's also on the Criterion Channel right now. So please go watch that queer classic if you haven't already. I'm so excited for next week's guest. And if I do you mind if we can edit it out? But can I tease this person is our first Brit. Hey. Maybe it's Kim Cattrall. The pond. <laughs> we oh, can you imagine? I can't believe I I can believe, but Kim Cattrall is on that show with Hillary Duff, and I'm just very excited about it. I think I'm just gonna watch it just because, like, because I love both of them and I wanna support Obviously. Kimberly. <laughs> Actually, her name is not Kimberly. I know this from research, but uh, her so many times that I think her her given name is Kim. And isn't she the Irish, the I, the, the 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 Liverpool Rose? She's uh, Liverpool's Cleopatra. That's what she put on her tombstone. Never forget it. By the way, like it's interesting to me anybody that engraves their headstone in advance. I just think it's a choice. I love her so much. Okay. Honey bunnies, <laughs> if you if you're receiving what we're given, please follow us on social media. You can find us on all mediums at Rodeman. That's R O D E M A N N E and Damian Bellino. That's Damian with an A D A M I A N B E L L I N O. Why? Thanks for spelling everything out. You might know her from is produced by us. That's Ann Rodeman and Damian Bellino. We want to thank our consultants in Grumpy Entertainment, Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears. They keep us honest. They keep us motivated. And they are so very kind. All of that expert editing you hear is also by Daniel Sears. Special thanks to Gang. All the music that you hear underscoring each and every episode of You Might Know Her From is by Gang. You can download and stream Gang wherever you listen to your music. Folks, you know my colleague over here, Ann Rodeman, gets in those Google Docs and writes a whole laundry list of show notes for you. That's why you can keep track of all of the titles of all of Lauren's solo shows. You can find her books. You can find interviews she did talking about The Daily Show. All of those good deeds. You're going to be able to find that interview where Juliette Lewis says she doesn't like the arc of her character on Yellow Jackets. (laughs) Please go watch it. Like I'm, tr- I'm trying to order sushi tonight with our friend Brenna, and I, and I'm like, okay, I want a combo. I want like a spicy tuna. I want a spicy salmon, and then I'll take whatever a spicy yellow, you know, yellowtail or something else in there. Sure, sure. I'll even take a California roll if that's how it comes. I don't want it, but that's what I will do. But all of these places now, it's like, do you want two rolls with like seven pieces of sashimi? I like sashimi, but that's not, that's too much food for me. And then it's like, do you want nine pieces of sashimi with a California roll? No, I want a spicy salmon roll or a spicy tuna roll. Do I want like 11 pieces of sashimi with a salmon roll that's not spicy? (laughs) For $22? No. Knock off like $4, make it spicy salmon, and take off a piece of a couple pieces of sashimi. It's too much for me to handle. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to you, and I'm so sorry to me for having to listen to you say sashimi as many times as you just did. But do you remember that there was that sushi place that we went to like at least once or twice in Hell's Kitchen? Uh, and we were like, yeah, let's get one of... No, no, no. Not that. That's our place. That's our place. This And it survived the pandemic, thank God. No, there's a place on 9th Avenue, and I think we only went there once or twice. Twice, but we did were we like, get like a custom one of those roll. specialty rolls we were like yeah we're gonna get the pink lady roll please <laughs> i do it out of maraschino cherry i think is like an eyeball 